Every time we've defined something new, whether it was the derivative of a function or the integral of a function, or whether it was the limit of a function, or whether it was a sequence, every single time we came up with something new, we defined a bunch of algebraic properties for that mathematical thing. Series are no different. In series, we're going to try to figure out what algebraic rules are true. And indeed, the standard ones that you probably expect to be true are true here. If I have a convergent series an, and I multiply every single one of the terms by a constant c, then indeed that series, the, the sum of c times the an, is convergent, and more importantly, it converges to c times whatever the ans converge to. Likewise, if I have a couple different series, and both of those individual series are convergent, I can add them so-called term by term, that is, I can take the sum of the term by term additions, and that just ends up being the sum of the two different limits. To see why this might be true, if I let Sn denote the partial sum, so A1 plus all the way down to An, I'm only going to do here the first of these two expressions. So then if I go and, and multiply Sn by a constant C, this is just C times A1 plus all the way down to An. And I can use just normal old rules of algebra to say this is CA1 plus CAN. So this expression that I have over on the right hand side is just the partial sums of the C times AN series, the series that goes from zero up to infinity. Now I'm going to use a property of sequences, and I'm going to use this property of sequences to give me the analogous property for series. That is, Sn is a sequence, and C times Sn is a sequence, and I know that if Sn converges as a sequence, this is a claim about sequences, this is going to imply that multiplication by a constant for sequences is also going to converge. And in particular, if the Sn converges to a value of A, then the Csn is going to converge to C times A. And this is going to imply that the integral from n equal to, excuse me, the sum from n equal to 0 to infinity of the Cans is just the exact same thing as C times A. In other words, C times the sum from n equal to 0 to infinity of An. So it's, it's a proof that almost doesn't seem like it's doing anything because we're trying to prove a property and we just use that property to prove it. But the important point is I'm using that property for sequences to prove the analogous property for series. And that kind of pattern goes on all the time in mathematics. It's worthwhile to note one point, which is that if you have a sum of those two different things, then if one of them diverges and the other converges, the sum of the two things is going to diverge. So, so you need to really have both of the things converging in order for it to converge. You'll note here that, that one of the most important parts about what I've written down is this assumption. It says that if the ANs and the BNs are convergent, then we get this property. If one of them diverges, then it diverges. It's also the case that if, if both the AN and the BN diverge, so both the an and the bn diverge, then we actually don't know what the answer is. Uh, if, if a sum of two things that individually diverge, then the sort of term by term sum, it might diverge, it might converge, we don't know, and there's going to be examples on both sides. So be very clear when you're quoting these theorems that the assumptions are met. In this case, this ability to sum stuff up is absolutely dependent upon the claim that both the ANs and the BNs individually converge, and then the term-by-term -term sum is also going to converge. All right, that last slide made me so sweaty I had to go and change my shirt. But I am back for an example of how we might use these algebraic rules for series. So in this example, I have a difference of two things. I got an 8 to the N minus a 10 to the N on the top. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the two different pieces I'm going to analyze them separately. I'm going to see whether the two different pieces individually, whether they're converging or whether they're diverging. And then depending on those answers, I may or may not be able to use one of those rules. So first one up is I'm going to study the sum from n equal to 0 to infinity of the 8 ninths to the power of n. 
So this is the this portion right here, and I've taken the 8 to the n over the 9 to the n. I sort of combined it into be an 8 ninths to the n. Now, this is a ratio, this 8 ninths, and it has magnitude less than 1. Therefore, by the ratio, or excuse me, by geometric series, it is going to converge, and more importantly, it converges to a value 1 over 1 minus 8 ninths, which is the same thing as 9. Likewise, we can deal with the other side here. We can deal with the 10 divided by 9 all to the power of 9. So let's do that one. Sum n is equal to 0 to infinity of 10 divided by 9 all to the power of 9. Well, in this case, my, my ratio of 10 ninths in absolute value, this is something which is greater than 1, and so it's going to diverge. So I'm, I'm doing the geometric series in both cases, it's just in one case the ratio is less than 1, in the other case the ratio is greater than 1. So returning to the previous slide for a moment, this, is, this bottom case is what I'm in. I've got one series which is convergent, I've got a second series which is divergent, and therefore the sum of my two different series is going to diverge. And then if I go all the way back to the beginning, this total thing, it diverges, and this is the sum of a convergent thing and a divergent thing. And again, I can remind you to be careful. If both the ANs and the BNs, if both of those diverge, you have no conclusion that you can draw. We're able to draw a conclusion here because one of them converged. It goes to some number. And so whatever the divergence is of the other one, that's going to make the entire thing diverge.